Hello, and thank you for watching Sabina Reefing, where we go over product reviews and how to's, livestock, care and selection, maintenance, tips and tricks. Come on, let me show you. What makes a ULM, you might ask? Well, there's two main things, I think. Reliability and ease of service. Ease of service can mean a few different things. One, I've made it so it's easy to do a water change, like I've showed you with my soft coral LPS tank, or soft coral ULM aquarium. And then there's also completely automated things like I did water changes for this aquarium that are completely automated. I don't do anything and it does a two gallon water change every day. And then ease of service. This is, sounds kind of counterintuitive since you're trying to do something that you don't have to service, ultra low maintenance, but making it easy to service is key because things do break. You're going to have a heater go bad. You're going to have a light fail. You're going to have multiple things fail. So there's quite a few different things you can do to tidy up your wiring and make it easy to get in and out, such as don't use zip ties, use Velcro, to make it much easier to service because you are still going to have some service even with the ULM Aquarium. There's two broad types of ULM Aquariums. There's ULM, Soft Coral, LPS, Fish Only Aquariums, and there's also uh, ULM, LPS again, SPS aquariums. There's two ways you can do it. So when you do a soft coral or fish only aquarium, you don't need a lot of gear. You just need reliable gear and for things to be somewhat automated so it's taking care of itself that doesn't have you sticking your hands in the aquarium every day. When you start doing hard coral tanks such as SPS or a lot of LPS, you need to test the calcium, you need to do auto top off, you need to do a lot of things to this aquarium on a very regular basis and you need to automate it. So what that boils down to in dollar and cents is with a soft coral tank you have very, well you have less gear so not as much money and when you have an SPS ULM you have a lot of gear and some considerable startup costs. So what do I think is some of the best gear for doing an SPS ULM Aquarium? Well for me you have to have a tank controller. This is just if you're going to do SPS and you want ULM you need something that's going to monitor and look out for you on a lot of these things. I personally like the Apex. Um, there's also a really cool new controller out from Coral View called the Hydros. Looks really promising. I've already been with Neptune Apex for a few years, so it's a little bit hard for me to switch at this point. Um, so you're going to need a controller and so that it can watch, make sure your salinity is not going out of whack, make sure your calcium, your alkalinity, and all of those things are in check. You're also going to need an auto top off. Um, this is probably an ambiquitous gear you need it for either a soft coral or an SPS aquarium, or probably any aquarium. Um, I am using right now on this one, I'm using the Neptune Apex ATK. It's nice because you can do interesting programming things with it. Um, like right now, I'm in video mode on my fish tank and so it's not going to dose any water so it doesn't make any noise while I'm sitting here recording, which is very nice. Uh, when you have an ATO, I, a lot of people put a jug next to the aquarium. For me, that's not enough. This tank can go from through anywhere from three to five gallons of water a day during summer and probably two gallons a day in winter. That's a lot of buckets to still be hauling around. So I actually have hooked this up directly to the DI system in my garage about 100 feet that way. This is a lot less maintenance for me and that's one of the keys for me is not carrying jugs of water around. Whether that's water changes, which in this case, again, the Neptune Apex dose is doing the water changes for me daily, or if it's carrying buckets of water around for the uh, auto top off, or carrying buckets of calcium and alkalinity, which again is being taken care of for me by the Neptune Apex while running two of the BRS dosers. Uh, the dose in conjunction with the Neptune Apex Triton has a really cool program that can actually do all of your dosing and monitor it for you and control it. I have written a little script, I'll have it up here on the screen, that is what I'm doing currently for the BRS dosers. It has 
probably less safeties, but I don't know what the safeties are that uh, Neptune Apex has written in there. But it does accommodate when alkalinity starts rising too high, it will dose less. And when alkalinity goes down too much, it will dose more. So it has some safeties built into that to try and hold my aquarium at a fairly regular alkalinity. I let the calcium kind of float a little bit more, but uh, when you're having an SPS aquarium, having consistent alkalinity, I think, is an important thing. Um, water changes are kind of a torn mixed group. Everybody has their own opinion on water changes. Personally, I like doing uh, automatic water dose or water changes. So this aquarium gets two gallons a day, like I said, coming out of the garage, and I actually built a whole mixing station so that it holds 300 gallons so I don't have to mix it every single day. This is important to me because mixing water and getting it to the right salinity is difficult. So in this system, basically I press one button and it pumps 50 gallons of water into the 300 gallon jug. I pour one bag of salt in, I push one more button and it mixes it for three days and then it stops. So when I'm going to mix up a new batch of water, it's not, oh, I have to spend two days filling up my 300 gallon container then I have to take and dose a bunch of bags of salt and then adjust. I've set it up so that it quickly and easily adds 50 gallons of salt water to the usually 150 to 200 gallons of salt water that's already currently there. And I don't have to turn off my auto water changes or anything while I'm mixing another 50 gallons in with the 150 gallons that's already there. When you have this automation, you have a new risk. The risk is that one of these things is going to fail and cause an issue either in your aquarium or with your house. So with four or five lines going into my tank between the auto top off the salt water going in, the salt water going out, the calcium going in, the calcium go, or the alkalinity going in, and with the amino acids all being dosed or added or removed, I put a leak detector in the bottom of my aquarium. This is going to give me some peace of mind that, hey, something is having an issue and I need to go see it. And I have had issues before. Um, and so it gave me a chance to come back, fix it, before it destroyed my tank or my house. So I highly recommend, if you're going to be doing this much automation, to at least invest in some safety for your house. A leak detector is a wise investment. When you have an SPS aquarium, getting your salinity out of whack, or your pH, or your ORRP, or your calcium, or your alkalinity, or your magnesium, or most importantly, your temperature, any one of these can have a detrimental effect on your aquarium. Some of them can have a truly devastating effect on your aquarium. Uh, most, mostly temperature, alkalinity, and salinity. Those are probably the most important when you're running an SPS ULM or an SPS aquarium, period. So I monitor pH, ORP, salinity, calcium, alkalinity, magnesium. I run everything through the Neptune Apex. The reason I ran it all through the Neptune Apex is because the fact they can send me a text message and I can have it say what is going wrong and I can set the limits of when to give me an alarm. What's just as bad as not getting an alarm is getting too many alarms and turning the alarms off. So when you have an SPS aquarium, set up your monitoring system, set up your heartbeat, set up everything you can for an alarm, but also don't set it so close that you're Oh, my calcium went up to 500, I'm getting an alarm. Uh, don't worry about it until your calcium gets up to 550. Hey, 550, I got a problem. I'm going to start killing stuff real soon. 500, I uh, run it 480. Doesn't really matter. Um, or you run it 450 and you set it at 500. You want to give it a good range to move around in that doesn't give you an alarm every single day. There is a debate going on in the saltwater community about sand or no sand, and I think it's complete personal preference. I like sand in my aquariums. Well, people say, hey, you have to vacuum that sand every single day to let it look sparkling white. I let my sand grow a little coralline algae. Um, it doesn't get big brown patches of dinoflagellates or cyano. Uh, I keep the flow up, and I have one sand sifting starfish, I have never cleaned the sand bed in my six-year-old uh, LPS slash soft coral tank, which is ULM, and I have never cleaned the sand in this SPS aquarium ever. 
I don't even own a house. I couldn't, I couldn't clean it if I wanted to. So saying you have to clean your sand every day, not true. Saying that it's better to not have sand, I don't know. Uh, there is some advantages of getting that to try to sell. There's also a nice little biome going on underneath my sand of animals and things eating the detritus. So you're going to have to make your own decision up on the sand or no sand. I don't know. So one thing that I used to think would make my aquarium less maintenance, but it truly turned it into more maintenance and is a pitfall, if you will, when you're doing yellow equipment uh, aquarium is auto feeders. I used the Neptune Apex auto feeder. It's a great auto feeder. I still think it's probably the best. But when you're dosing dry pellet food, it's very easy to overdose. And when you are not the person dosing the dry pellet food, it's extremely easy to overfeed your aquarium. And this leads to algae blooms and all kinds of negative things that you don't want in your aquarium. So I simply just shy away from auto feeders. I still have to feed my aquarium. If you can't feed your aquarium, find someone to feed your aquarium. That's what I did with my tank at work. So now the receptionist just dumps in a cube of food or two cubes of food a day. So it's much better to have someone help you feed the fish than to do an auto feeder. I have played with the idea of putting an auto feeder back on this aquarium and have it dosed like once a week, just so that when I'm out of town and me and my wife are gone for four or five days, I can have it feed the aquarium maybe twice. Once on a Tuesday and once on a Thursday. Um, but I don't recommend using an auto feeder every day. It will probably turn into a nutrient problem. So one thing I have in this aquarium that doesn't look like a ULM thing, but I think it might be, is UV. Uh, when I put this UV sterilizer in, I did it for a specific reason. I was trying to reduce pathogens. Uh, specifically, I had some fish that were sick and I was trying to do my best because trying to catch fish in this 300 gallon aquarium is not something that's easy and questionable whether you can really do it without taking a bunch of stuff out. So I put that in for that reason. What I did notice was a lot of the dinoflagellates and a lot of different algaes that were blooming in my tank at the time because it was a fairly new aquarium disappeared like in days. So UV definitely does have some benefits when it comes to algae. Another piece of equipment that seems like it can be or can't be a uh, ULM thing is reactors. I try and use as little media as possible. Um, so I occasionally fill up a bag with carbon and throw it in my sump. I do not run any media reactors of bio pellets, of carbon, of GFO, of sulfur denitrifying. I run none of that. Um, the more things you put in a ULM system, the more things you have to maintain. So a lot of these goods and products do exactly what they're supposed to do, but it doesn't necessarily mean you always need them. Uh, I think with carbon, I do definitely get some benefits of it. I keep a bucket of carbon and I use it sparingly uh, or sporadically, not sparingly, sporadically. So make your own decision on that. I would always recommend less is more. So I, right now this aquarium has been running for about six months without any carbon, but that doesn't mean I'm not going to use carbon if I think I need it. When it comes to heating and cooling, the heater is the most likely thing to fail. Uh, I had one fail last week on my tank at work. I got an alarm on my cell phone on Saturday that the tank was dropping in temperature. I came in on Monday, the tank was down to 75 point something degrees. I put a new heater in because now the store was open and I was able to buy a heater. And the tank came right back up to its normal 78 and it wasn't an issue at all. Uh, if I had not had a uh, alarm for my Neptune Apex, I would have probably gone out on field service calls and maybe not known for a week. And maybe a bunch of fish had died, which would cause nutrient problems. And suddenly now I'm trying to quarantine a bunch of fish. It would have caused me more work if I had not known about it. Knowing about it is key with the ULM Aquarium. Then when it comes to another thing that can fail for heating and cooling is your cooling. So um, a chiller is basically a refrigerator that you pass water through 
that then goes back into your aquarium to take heat out of your aquarium and hopefully dump it outside or in another room or not in your living room and basically just moves the heat to another location so that you don't have to deal with it. I don't like chillers. I think they use a lot of power, uh, electricity, and they can fail and you'll never know about it. So the compressor can turn on, it's running, the fan's turning on, your tank temperature's rising, but the Freon's leaked out and now you have something that's just generating heat and pumping heat into your water. That's not ideal. So I don't recommend chillers. They're some really nice ones out there. I simply don't run them because a I got some $4 fans from Amazon that work perfectly fine. I've got two four inch fans on this 300 gallon aquarium and I can lower it a few degrees in a day, which this tank does not heat up or cool down very quickly at all. Downside to fans on cooling an aquarium, you are using evaporative cooling. It evaporates water. So the next thing that you're gonna need is a dehumidifier in your house, which is another piece of equipment and you will have to empty the water out of this. So that sounds like it's extra work. Well, some of the dehumidifiers actually have a drain that you can run and actually plumb it straight into a drain so that you don't have to drain it every single day, which is what I'm currently doing. And that's the next thing on my ULL system is making it so that the dehumidifier is not a bunch of work every single day. What about power heads when it comes to ULM? Well, these are the Neptune Systems Wave. They're an awesome pump, a lot of flow, a lot of control. They get a little bit noisier than my Tunzi pumps do when they get dirty. So I have to take these out, set them on top of a ladder, balanced with a bucket of vinegar, and scrub them up there because taking them out of the water wiring harness on the top of the aquarium is too much work. So these, when it comes to ease of maintenance, like I said, ease of maintenance, ease of service is an important thing when it comes to ULM because when it's a small little thing, it's not that big of a deal. Like if these were MP40s, you pop the wet side off, set it in vinegar, pop your other new wet side on, and you would already be done. So I think when it comes to ease of maintenance, I really like the uh, Ecotech Marine MP40s. Uh, they're, they're a staple in the industry right now. And then I also like the Tunzies. Um, a lot of people are worried about how much flow they do or do not get. They make a decent amount of flow. They have very easy battery backups that are sizable and scalable to whatever you want. You wanna go get 10 car batteries and have a battery backup that lasts a week or two weeks or a year? Go ahead, buy as many batteries as you want, which is a nice benefit. And then also that 6095 has been running non-stop now for 14 months and it is still silent. I don't know what wizardry they did to make it so that that pump makes no noise, but it makes no noise. So 6095, 6105, 6205, the Tunzi powerheads, DC battery, DC ones, so I have a battery backup, are absolutely the way to go. They are very simple, very easy to use, and very controllable with pointing. I am probably going to move both of these waves to these two overflow boxes, and then I'm going to put some MP40s on that side, MP40s on that side, and some uh, 6095s and 6105s on the back wall. Uh, without enough flow in an SPS aquarium, you start getting funny growth in some of your corals, and I'm starting to see some interesting SPS growth patterns that aren't exactly what I want, so make sure you have good flow. This is also important for nutrient export. Not having enough flow can be a problem when it comes to any aquarium, but when you're doing a ULM SPS aquarium, less flow can lead to problems and you're trying to eliminate problems when you're doing a ULM. Okay, what lighting should we use when we're dealing a ULM? LED. Next slide. I would go LED. That's it. That's the only way I would ever go if you're doing a ULM. They can, are controllable. They produce plenty of light and par. They can grow coral. They can color up coral. And they don't require maintenance. If you're doing a ULM, that one is a big important one. I haven't done anything to these Ecotech Radions 
since I put them on this aquarium. That's it. Nothing. So you can't get less maintenance than no maintenance. And here is the big crux of a ULM aquarium is filtration. Uh, filter socks, roller mats, skimmers, refugiums, um, water changes, all of these deal with taking the nutrients out of the water. There's some that are very efficient, there's some that are very easy, there's some that are very difficult. And I believe it or not, they all have their benefits and their drawbacks. My personal opinion is a refugium. I go in there about once a month, I grab a big basketball size of Chato, and I throw a basketball size wave of Chato away. Then I come back in a month, maybe two months, and throw another basketball away. It's kept my nitrates and phosphates at near undetectable levels the entire time, and it's fairly easy. Once a month, once every other month, I can do that amount of work. I did have an awesome skimmer, which was the uh, Vertex Alpha 200. Awesome skimmer. I actually even think I got better coloration using that. I had a little bit higher nitrates and a little bit higher phosphates, and my corals looked better with the skimmer. Problem is, I had to get in there and scoop muck out once a week at least. I didn't want to scoop the muck out anymore. So I actually traded uh, SVS coloration for ease of maintenance. If you can't compromise on your colors or your filtration, I understand that. But there is some nice things that you can do to make your skimmer less maintenance. Uh, you can get a big container. I would suggest having a breather that has some carbon or something so it doesn't smell up the house. You can get a neck cleaner. Uh, Vertex sells a really nice one. Uh, there also is even a sprayer for washing out the cup. I think if you got a, a quality skimmer that had some of these maintenance features built into it, it would be a lot easier to take care of than digging in there every couple days and rooting around with your hand inside the aquarium. So, not saying skimmers aren't ULM, I'm just saying mine wasn't the way I had it set up. And so I switched to refugium, which has been very low maintenance. Roller mats, um, some people say they smell, some people say they don't smell. I've heard a lot of people really love them and have replaced their don't have a refugium, don't have a skimmer, so it can be a complete filtration system by itself. So that is a valid way to take care of it. Um, most of the really nice installs, if you look them up, uh, have it built into the sump. Might be a way that makes it less maintenance. I would always be thinking about how I'm getting these in and how I'm getting these out so that it's not too much work. And then there's filter socks, which are a no-go. If you're doing a ULM, you're not pulling your filter socks every other day or every day. That's the exact opposite of ULM. Um, filter socks had a great purpose. They worked great. I've used filter socks. I'm never going to use filter socks again. It's too much work. And then the last one that's not very popular but is still a completely valid way to do a ULM aquarium is water changes. If you do a 5 or a 10% weekly water change, 10% weekly water change, you may not have to do anything else. Um, so, but on this 300 gallon aquarium with 150 gallon sump, to do a 10% weekly water change would probably be 40 to 45 gallons of water. Well, since I have SPS, maybe I want to do a 20%. So now that's 80 to 100 gallons of water. That's a lot of water to be dumping out of the aquarium every single day. So I am not big on big aquariums doing water change to maintain calcium alkalinity and lower their nitrates and phosphates. I would shy away from this for large aquariums, but for a small aquarium, hey, I got a 20 gallon aquarium. What do you do? I change two gallons of water a day and it's automated to a big container in my garage. That sounds pretty ULM to me. In retrospect, what would I change on my aquarium to make it more ULM? I am going to replace these with MP40s. I love the MP40s. Taking the heads off, swapping them out is a much simpler way to clean your power heads. That's the only reason I'm doing it that way. That will make my work less. That's probably the hardest task I have on this aquarium. Uh, what are you going to do on your aquarium to help make it less maintenance for you? Tell me in the comments down below. I'm interested. 
Now, I get most of my ideas the same way you are. I'm watching YouTube videos and I'm reading the vlogs. So, until next time, thank you for watching. And I've got some more videos over here. And click that like and subscribe button.